This video discusses the action that's introduced in Chapter 13. It's known as HK, which is short for Helmholtz Kohlrausch. Um, we will use HK in the layers palette because that's the only thing that fits. Um, it's a complicated action, has a lot of different steps in it, um, and the fortunate thing is you don't need to really know them in order to make good use of the action. You just have to know what it tries to do, which is to find the areas which are not particularly colorful in the image and darken them up to a certain point. Also, it tries to poison those colors to a certain extent. That is, it finds colors that aren't exactly the most colorful in the picture, and it neutralizes them somewhat. And the purpose there is to make the more colorful areas stand out a bit more. Um, it's Like I said, it's easier to illustrate than it is to explain. So I'm going to start right here with uh, the first picture of the chapter, which is the Swiss Glacial Lake picture uh, of figure 13.1, 13.2. So here it is. Um, this is the sort of thing that HK might work well with because it's so dominated by sort of semi-happy colors. There's a danger if we start to add a lot of color to the picture that it'll just seem like a whole bunch of green blobs. So I'm going to try the HK action to see what happens. Pop. Okay. You see that it has uh, two layers and also has a layer group here in case we want to turn it off and see a before and after. So that's, that's a before, that's an after. Probably you would agree it doesn't look as good after as it did before, but that's sort of beside the point. The question is whether it'll look better when we're done with the thing. Okay, the action is, consists of two different layers do very different things. The first layer is the one that's more likely to be useful. This is the one that doesn't really change color. It's just darkening the somewhat neutral areas. Let's look at before and after here. Here's the original, and here's after. In this particular case, I would say it looks a lot better. Um, it looks deeper, it looks more three-dimensional, and probably the reason is that this area here in the upper right corner has become a little bit heavier, uh, be, and this makes the foreground stand out a bit more. So the bright colors of the lake seem a little bit happier, and we get a better sensation of depth. Notice that it doesn't darken the very dark sweater that the woman is wearing. That's uh, the function of a mask that's part of this action. Um, and we have to be careful that the action is only really darkening the midtones like it is here. So again, there's before, there's after. <clears throat> the use of this layer is pretty much up to you. Either you can like what it does or not. If you don't like it, turn it off. Um, if you do like it, stick with it. The more complicated one is the one that poisons the color, which is this one. Okay, so it makes a lot of things grayer. Make, actually, it makes almost everything grayer, but things that started out more gray than others, like this area here again, are hurt more by this than otherwise. So it's sort of a, a preparation for adding more color later by poisoning the weakest colors so that we will be able, when we do start to intensify color, to make this thing to make the brightest greens more pronounced without making the entire picture look too green. This, if you're conservative about it, you may want to reduce the opacity somewhat. So let's say there, there's about half of what the default opacity would be. There's before, there's after. That's not an improvement if this is the final result, but it's, I think it's definitely going to be an improvement if we move on to the point where we would um, uh, enhance colors. So let me flatten the image now, and I'm going to move it into LAB and run the action that we normally would, which is the um, MMM plus color boost action, like this. And you see, this is, this is quite a bit too colorful. But that's okay. We don't, this illustrates why we don't really need to worry about poisoning colors earlier with HK. We just move this thing down to something more, uh, more agreeable. And so here we have it. Even if we don't make any further moves than this, this, I think, is going to be a lot more attractive than the original was. So let me revert to the original, and we can compare. There's before, and there's after. And there's a whole lot more interest in this after picture. And notice that in this after picture, we have some brilliant greens. Right here in the, uh, in the center left of the picture, we're seeing some really bright colors and also in the lake. But the whole picture 
does not seem like it's overwhelmingly colorful because this area here got cut back so much by the action. Now, if that's the way you'd like to use the action, you know, we don't need to know anything about how the internal workings of it function. Um, that's great. You don't even know that there was a channel that was put into play and then deleted afterwards. If you want to make more advanced use of this, and there's a whole lot of suggestions in the second half of the chapter as to how you would do it, you might want to save the intermediate channel. The way that I just showed it here, you may notice that there is no additional channel. Um, let me revert and show that if we just run the HK action like that, it just shows up with the regular three RGB channels be after it does its thing. Okay, and now I'm going to flatten it again. And this time, I will option click the action to bring up a, um, a different menu. And this one says, do you want to keep that extra channel for any reason? So I say, sure, let's keep it. Now it runs exactly the same action, except that we now have saved the, an additional channel. <clears throat> the, the bad part about saving an additional channel is if we ever want to save a JPEG, first of all, we, we can't save a JPEG with layers. We'd have to flatten. But we also cannot save a JPEG that includes an alpha channel. So that's the drawback of it. The good thing is that there are a lot of interesting things that you can do with this channel if you're motivated to experiment. Um, just to show one of them, I'm going to turn everything off, flatten the image, show you what this channel looks like, Oops, without showing the rest. So that's, that's what the ersatz black channel that this uh, action generates looks like. What good is it? Can be used for a lot of different masking situations and some blending situations too. But one of the simplest is this. Let's go back now to the original. And suppose we're interested in doing some unsharp masking. So let me pick a nice big number, probably too much. Definitely too much. There we go. Okay, how do we reduce the effect of the sharpening while still leaving it sharp where it, where it wants to be sharp? The answer would be an inverted copy of this ersatz black or there are various other ways of doing it, but this would be a good one. Okay, the ersatz black, if you invert it, will allow sharpening mostly of neutral areas. Let's show you. Here I'm going to add, add a mask to the sharpening layer, and to it, I'm going to apply the ersatz black channel. That's the source. And I invert it. See, this is what happens if I don't invert it and use it as a mask. And this is what happens if I do. Okay, that's before, without any mask, and that's with. It looks like the sharpening has gone away, but it's not true. See, there's the unsharpened version, and there's the one with the sharpening that's masked. And that's pretty good. If you think it's too much, of course, you can just reduce the opacity of the layer like that. I personally don't think it was too much. But even with the reduced opacity, it's very clear that this part of the image has gotten sharpened, has gotten sharper. So that's one of the uses for the ersatz black, if you want it. Um, if not, you can just keep doing things simply, as I showed in the first half of the video. And just remember, when you're done with it, just discard that channel, and then you can save it as whatever you want. So that's the HK action.